so I am Aritra Banik and uh, in the next few lectures I am going to talk about geometric algorithms. In the last three lectures what you are learning is uh, graph theoretic algorithms, but geometric algorithms is have some flavor of graph theoretic algorithms, but there is also a geometric version of the problem. So before I start I just want to know that how many of you know what is asymptotic notations are like uh, big O, small O, please raise your hand if you do not know. Okay, you do not know that what is uh, asymptotic notations are okay. and what about uh, how many of you do not know what is a balanced binary search trees? Balanced binary search tree. Okay. 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 Not to worry. Uh, okay. Uh, so today we'll have a. I'll take a so, uh, slow pace, and I will cover two geometric algorithms. <coughs> One is about convex hulls, and. Uh, you do not need to take notes. So, I will be providing all the slides that I am presenting to you and you can revise the material uh, by just looking at the slides. So, you do not have to remember anything. Uh, so, we will be discussing two algorithms. One is uh, on convex hull. I will define what convex hull is. And the second problem I will discuss is the art gallery problem, uh, which is a nice uh, because I like this problem very much because of its uh, first of all it is a geometric flavor and second is the proof technique that is being used to prove the theorem. We will come to that. But let us start our discussion with some uh, boring topics like uh, what is computational geometry. Uh, computational geometry started with mostly from the topics which were come out the problems that came out from VLSI design during uh, 90s, you understand that if you are designing a chip, a motherboard or a chip, how you place the chips inside the motherboard or the circuit, that matters a lot. How efficiently you can pack the small chips inside the motherboard, that can affect the size of the motherboard. In turn, that can affect the quality of the processor. How efficiently that is working. So, if you look at this problem, this is basically a geometric problem by nature that you are given a rectangle and another set of small rectangles and the question is whether you can fit the smaller rectangles into the bigger rectangle or not. Right? This is a typical computational geometry problem. So, talking about chips, maybe some of the chips create certain amount of heat and you do not want those chips to be placed together. Now, the question is can you place the chips so that the heat is distributed throughout the motherboard evenly? Can you do that? Again, this is a computational geometry problem. Other than that, you have many applications again from 90s that computer graphics. how to model a 3D figure so that you can visualize it. This is another typical example of computational geometry or there is a huge application of triangulation of geometric figures which is a computational geometry problems. So, this is from where the computational geometry started, but now if I look at computational geometry even it started from this basic problems on graphics and VLSI. Now, it has found its application in many areas like uh, even physical simulation, database, games and many more. But we will not able to cover all the topics, the all the even basic topics of computational geometry in this set of four lectures that I am going to cover next. But I will try to give you a flavor of this algorithms and the basic data structures or building block of this algorithms. If you start from this, you can at least 
read, able to read the results in computational geometry by yourself if you are interested. Okay. So again, a small history that the computational geometry started in 1976 by a thesis, PhD thesis by Michael Shamos. And then eventually there is a first computational geometry conference, then first implementation of computational geometry, first software, then first handbook in computational geometry. And this is the way the full-fledged research in computational geometry started around 2000. So it's a fairly young research domain and lot to be explored. The lots remains to be explored in the future. So today we will start with a very simple problem of finding a convex hull of a set of points. But before we move on to that, first we have to understand what a convex hull is. So what is a convex shape? It is a subset of the planes in R2 such that if you take any two points which are inside the convex hull, if you join them by a line then line will be completely con contained in the shape, clear? For example, if I take this shape, this is not convex because there exists a line, there exist two points if I join them, the com line is not completely inside the, the shape, good? Okay. So, with the definition of convex sets, so now think about that you are given a object which is, which is not convex or you are given a set of points in R2. Your objective is to find the minimum convex object that contains those objects or those points. So if this is my object, what is the minimum convex object that contains this whole shape is this one. If this is my set of points, what will be the minimum convex object that contains all these points are this, right? So what is our objective? Our objective is to given a set of points, we will not talk about how to find given a set of convex objects, how to find a, a given a set of objects, how to find a minimum convex object which covers this objects. We will start with a very basic problem that for all objects, we are only given a set of points, set of endpoints, and we want to find out the minimum convex object which covers all the points. That's the problem clear to everyone? So what is the input to the problem? N points, that means to N real values. For each point we have X coordinate, we have Y coordinate. And then after saying that I have written a small note that so order N in size, the input size is order N. What do I mean? Because I have just said the input size is 2N. So why I am saying that input size is order n. So this is the definition of the order notation that say so order n is a set of functions and one function f of n belongs to order n if there exists a constant, there are two constant n0 and c such that f of n is less than equals to c of n for all values of n greater than equals to n0. This is all set of such functions which belongs to this is a formal definition of what is the order of gn. Here you can see that I have written fn equals to order of gn. This is the creation of computer 
signs that this is not entirely a mathematical true statement. It should be, we should write that f n belongs to order of g n. Why? What is order of g n? Is a set of functions. Like if it is too much, if the definition is too notation heavy, you just naively speaking chop off the constant part. Computer scientists do not care about constants. There is a naive way to think about this. 4 n is order n, 5 n is order n, 3400 n is order n. There is a naive way to think about this. Similar for n square, n log n, we'll, we do not care about the constants. All good? And please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. And if I like give a lecture for half an hour and I do not see any questions coming from your side, I will start asking the questions. Okay, so, it is better that you keep me busy so that I do not ask questions. Okay, good. So, designing an algorithm, what is a designing algorithm? How to design algorithm? The algorithm comes from analyzing the properties. It is not like I will one day wake up in the morning and there is algorithm in my head. It does not work like that. I look at the problem and try, try to analyze the properties of the problem and by exploiting the properties, we would like to usually devise a algorithm and it takes maybe months, years to find out that exact property which will lead to a good algorithm. So, if I look at the convex hull problem, what properties can we see? The first property, if we think about the vertices, we know that the vertices has to be from the given set of points. The vertices of the convex hull, so what is a convex hull? Is a collection of vertices and the edges that <coughs> makes a convex hull. Now, if you see that, you can prove actually that the vertices has to be from the given set of points. What is the second property? That look at any convex hull edge. For example, look at this convex hull edge. This edge is a line segment. If I extend this line segment, I will get a line. I will call that a supporting line for this convex hull edge. Can you tell me a property of this convex hull edge or a supporting line for a convex hull edge? What do you mean by okay? Good observation that it will contain only two of these points. Okay, anything more? In one side of the exactly. That's a very good point. That if I look at the separating line passing through any two points, any two convex hull, consecutive convex hull vertices, then all the points lie on one side of the, on one side of this line. That is, I am assuming a general position assumption that no three points are collinear, no four points are co-circular. It can be handled, not a big issue. But the key property is, a line passing through two points is a supporting line if and only if all the given points are in the one side of that line. Are you with me till now? Very nice. So, we have explored two properties. Now, can you give me an algorithm to find the convex hull? A bad, bad algorithm. I am fine with a bad but correct algorithm. Just from this property. So, what is the property says that 
check any line which is passing through two given points and if all the points in one side of that line that has to be part of the convex hull. Yes? Mm -hmm. You are in the you are in the right direction. Forget about graphs. There is no graphs here yet. Yes. So how to find whether the line is supporting line or not? So I will. So how many pair of lines are there? No, how many sorry, how many pairs of points can be there? There are n points, so there are n choose two n square many. I will check one point, draw the line and see that whether all the points lies in one side of that line or not. How much time? O of n, forget about the constant, right? n square lines each taking order n time. So n cube time, I can find out the supporting lines, I can find out the edges. Hence, I can find out the convex hull, right? So we have a order n cube time algorithm. Is this algorithm clear to everyone? Clear? If you have a question, please raise your hand. Do you have a question? I found all the edges, finding or supporting lines means finding all the edges. Right, finding all the edges means finding the convex hull. Just follow the edges. Then you will find the convex hull and you have the convex hull. All good? But the problem is order, time taken is order n cube, too slow. It is a correct algorithm. The first objective of us is to find a correct algorithm, which may be a bad runtime, but a correct algorithm. This is a correct algorithm. Question is can we improve this? Let us see. So what we will do is, we will do an incremental algorithm. What is the incremental algorithm? So we will scan the points, scan the given points from left to right, right? And process the points one by one. There is another property of the convex hull that we have not discussed it yet is the following. That is, if I traverse the convex hull in the clockwise direction, first this, then this, then this, then see that I am always making a right turn. Start from here, I come, came here, then I take a right turn. What do I mean by taking a right turn? If you see the external angle, is always more than 180 degree. Right? So my question is, can we exploit this property to build a fast algorithm? Let us see. So what we will do, I will sort the points from left to right. Sorting means I am arranging just keep it over there. I will arrange the points from left to right and you have to believe me that there is an algorithm which solves this problem in order n log n time n log n time. Why n log n? 
we don't want to get into that details right now, believe me. You can go back and see and it's not very difficult. So now I have a sorted order of points from left to right. And what I'm interested in to build the upper hull. What is upper hull? You see the leftmost point and the rightmost point. A convex hull is made of two chains. The first chain, if I join these two points, suppose the point there are points here and here, then there exists a chain which of convex hull which lies above this line. There exists a chain of in this convex hull which lies below the convex hull. If I give you algorithm to find the upper convex hull, is it good enough? I will use the same algorithm to find the lower convex hull and it will be the twice the time and two, what we do computer scientist, ignore the constant. So, we will only consider the case where we are trying to find the upper convex hull. So, let us see how to do that. So, first we will do, we will insert the first two while scanning from left to right, I will insert the first two vertices that I have scanned into the system. Because I need at least three vertex to make a convex hull. Then I add the third vertex and I check whether the third vertex makes the external angle more than 180 degree or not or is it a right turn or not, is it? Hmm? With the current, I do not know anything about, I do not know anything here, I do not know anything. But this local information, with this local information, does this line makes a right turn or a left turn? Right turn. So, I will accept that. Then comes the next point. Does it make a right turn or a left turn? This angle is less than 180 degree, backtrack. So, what is it, what does I mean by backtrack? Exactly this, update. Drawn this, I have wrongly drawn, drawn this, I am deleting it. What I will do? I will delete this point and join the, this vertex with the previous vertex. Now what is the angle? Is it more than 180 degree? Till now we are good. Okay. Next this, what we have to do angle is less than 180 degree, backtrack. Next this, are we good? Are we good? No. What do we have to do? What do we have to do? What do we have to do? And so on. Clear algorithm? This is simple algorithm. Okay. So this is a description of the algorithm. You can go back home, why I have included because I will share the slides with you. You can go back home and see the minute details and how to implement the algorithm. This is a very basic way the algorithm works. So, we have given a algorithm, but what was our objective? Is to beat n cube time. Have we done that? Let us see. So, what is the first step we have done? Sorting, how much time it takes? N log, you have to believe me. What is the next step? Adding the point to the convex hull, how much time? Order 1, forget about this. 
Next, next part is after adding the point, I am checking whether it is making a right turn or a left turn. If it is the external angle is less than 180, we backtrack, right? So, we may have to do a k mini backtracks in each step. So, at each step, I am assuming at the ith step, I am doing k i many backtracks. So, this is the overall running time. What is k i? How many backtracks we need to move? How many backtracks we need to make? Hmm? Can be order n, it can be n by 2, right? Suppose I have an example. Suppose this is my set of points. So, I will add this, 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 but finally, I have to backtrack to get this edge. So, each ki can be of order n. So, what is the runtime? If I sum up n till n times, I will get order n square. So, order n square plus order n log n, it is order n square. We have beaten the bound of order n cube. Are you with me? That was our objective. But are you happy? Have we done the analysis carefully? In one iteration, we can delete n many points. But can we do this operation repetitively? Can we delete n many points? Or if I think from a different direction, how many times I can delete a point from the structure? Suppose I take any point, I have added, I will add this point, I will add every point. I will delete some point, I will keep some other points. How many times I can delete a point? Once deleted, can this point be able to get back? So, each point I am deleting at most once, right? So, sum of the deletions is how much can be bounded by is bounded by order n. Sum of the deletions means sum of the points, number of points that is being deleted and each point can deleted contribute that to that number at most once. So, total n points, right? So, the total number of deletions is bounded by order n. So, summation of ki is order n. So, if I put that in the previous equation, what we get? This terms becomes order n. So, n log n plus order n is n log n. Is it okay? Questions? Questions? So, I have a question. Okay. We have started with n cube, we came to n log n. So, it is possible to go to even n, maybe log n time we can solve this problem who said that I have to spend n log n time to find a convex hull. Is it necessary? We do not know that, right? There may be a better algorithm because the first I give you a n cube algorithm, suddenly I jump to n log n, huge jump. Can we expect more such jumps?
So it is known that you cannot do sorting in time with the current model of computation. You cannot do sorting in time less than n log n. n log n bound is tight. With that assumption, yes, you cannot find convex hull of n points in n log n time. Can you prove that? We assume that sorting cannot be done in time less than n log n. Now, your objective is to prove that even convex hull cannot be solved for n points in time less than n log n. That will keep as I will keep as homework and I will check with every student that whether they are able to done it or not during the tutorial session. I need a proof that what you need to do it is you have to prove that if you can solve suppose there is a black box you understand if you do not understand what a black box is suppose your algorithm which solves convex hull in time say order n then that black box using that black box we can devise another algorithm which will so which will solve sorting in time order n which is a contradiction hence it is not possible that is the idea of the proof. Still with me math students, computer science students, doubts? Okay. So, this is the very basic problem in computational geometry to how to find a convex hull. So, seen a basic problem and we will slightly now move towards a combinatorial aspect of computational geometry. Computational geometry is not all about like writing programs, there is a combinatorial part of it as well. I will not say it is a combinatorial part, I will prefer to say it as a puzzle or fun part. Let us see, uh, let us discuss, try to explore that part of computational geometry by the following problem. What is the problem? So, suppose you have a secured location, it can be a army base or a airport or some military installation and your objective is to place cameras in different part of this airport or this army base or area. So, that you can cover the whole area. So, I will formally define everything. So, this is the objective. Now, this is a too vague a problem to solve. Let us try to formalize this problem. How can we model a army base or a secure facility? By a simple polygon. I will give a formal definition of a simple polygon that what a simple polygon is. You, I hope that everyone understand what is a polygon is. So, I have given a simple polygon and our objective is to place certain guards because this is like a late 90s problem or maybe 1970s problem. So, people do not know what cameras are, cameras can be used for monitoring that was not known at that time. So, we can like argue this problem from the current scenario as well. Suppose these are cameras <coughs> and what is the property of a camera that we can assume that these cameras can see 360 degree around themselves. So, for example, look at this camera. Is this camera able to see this point? This point? What? Is it possible for a camera to see through the walls? So, this point will not be visible, point P will not be visible from the camera CI. So, no, but this yes. Is it clear? So, what is the algorithmic question here? What is the immediate algorithmic question that can be asked from this setup? That what is the minimum number of cameras required to cover 
the whole polygon. But what I have promised you is that I will not take a algorithmic part for the next class. I will take a combinatorial part. I will take a combinatorial <coughs> detour. What is the combinatorial question here? Suppose I give you a polygon P. This is my polygon P. And let us denote the minimum number of guards required to guard this polygon P by GP. So, let us call it F maybe. And if I look at and this polygon suppose has n vertices. Now, if I look at all the polygons of size n that which contains n many vertices, what is the minimum number of what is the minimum number of guards required to guard any polygon with n vertices? That I am calling f of n. What is f of n? That is the minimum number of guards required to guard any polygon with n vertices. You give me any polygon with n vertices, I can assure you that f of n guards are always sufficient. So, this is the formal definition of f of n. The max over g of p where p is a polygon with n vertices. Clear? Clear? Question. Can we bound f of n? Or say I have used g of n by mistake. So, can we bound g of n? What do I mean by bound? Can we say that every polygon with n vertices can be guard with n guards? Can we say that? Or can we say that every polygon with n vertices can be guarded by n square mini guards? Or can we say that every polygon with n vertices can be guarded by n by 5 mini guards? Can we say, can we give a bound on this number? Is the question clear to you? So, we are trying to bound this function g of n. N is possible? You think N is possible? Ok. Let us see. I want to push it as like as small as possible. How many people believe that it is N? Raise your hand. N is possible. Like with N guards I can always cover any polygon with N vertices. Please raise your hand if you believe this. Okay. Let's see. So before we deal with that problem, no, this is not a three guards. What I'm trying to portray is that x can see z, x can see y, but y cannot see z and z cannot see y. Right? So, we have just finished studying convex hull. So, if the polygon is a convex polygon, how many guard is needed? Suppose we have a convex polygon. I know that the polygon is convex. Okay, that is a good starting point. Let us see. Again, some history of the problem that this problem was first proposed by Victor Klee in a maths conference to Shatal. And as mathematician immediately, not immediately, maybe after one day, Shatal give a proof but which is very complicated. But we are not going to explain that proof today. What we are going to explain is after the conference when the problem becomes popular, 
Steve Fisk give a proof from the book. Does anyone knows what the book is? Okay, so do you know who is uh, Paul Eldos was? Paul Eldos was a famous mathematician. He has a very colorful character. He used to, he don't have like, he don't have a home. He used to travel from country to country solving mathematical problems. Like he has many papers with many authors, like many young researchers he has written paper. So he has a theory that God has a book, the book, which contains all the beautiful proofs. And sometimes, he allows us mortals to have a look inside the book. And it's not who, that this is, this quote is not by me, it's by, to be on the safe side, I just mentioned that this quote is not by me, by Paul Eddowes, that it's not necessary that you believe in God, but, sh but you should always believe in the book. So for every complicated proof, there is a simple proof, and that is written on the book. It's just we are not able to see it. And it's widely believed that this proof that I'm going to present is from the book. And there is a book called the proofs from the book. And it contains this proof. In my support, I should say that. Okay, so let's see. So what is the definition of a simple polygon? It's a chain of polygonal curves which do not intersect, the, which do not self-intersect. So this is not a simple polygon, whereas this is. And when talking about, you know, by Jordan curve theorem, any polygon divides the whole region into three parts, interior, exterior, and the boundary. So I am very absent-minded. So depending on the context, sometimes by polygon I'll mean that only interior, sometimes I'll mean interior and the boundary. So you have to figure it out, okay? Also, one more thing that when I say that a simple polygon, I do not include the polygons with holes. They have topologically different and they have some different characteristics. I don't mean when I'm saying a simple polygon, I only mean the simple polygon without holes. This is an example of a simple polygon with holes. I'm not dealing with this kind of situations. Okay, let's go. I ask you a question that, okay, let's ask this question. What about D3, what's the value of D3? What is D3? It's the number of guards needed to guard any polygon with three vertices. Has to be a triangle, a convex shape, always one. What about four? For four, there can be two cases. Suppose one case is if I take the convex hull of the convex polygon or the simple polygon, all the four points are on the convex hull. How many guards needed? The other case, three outside and one inside. How many guards needed? One. Homework. Prove that G4 equals to, which, which I have almost done, is equals to one. G5 is also equals to one. That is any polygon with five vertices can always be guarded with one guard. Still with me? Very good. Let's ask a different question. Suppose I have a set of guards which sees the whole of the boundary of the polygon. Trying to simplify the problem. I have a set of guards which sees the boundary of the polygon. Does it imply that they will see the whole interior of the polygon? So I have a set of guards which sees the boundary of the polygon. It completely sees the boundary of the polygon. 
But does it see that does it definitely see the interior? How many believe it's yes? Almost all. Right? The orange points are the guards. Does this orange point see the boundary of the polygon? Does it uh, does the orange point see the whole of the polygon? This is not a hole. This is a whole polygon. Can you see a point? Can an orange guard see a point inside this blue region? So intuitions can be wrong for this problem. How many are still convinced that the correct bound is order n? With n guards, we can always see the, all the polygons. I don't know. This example certainly applies for the case that if I even place guards at alternate vertex, it may not work. This is, I have placed guard in every alternating vertex, but still I am not able to see the whole polygon. I will see, but that is not proved by not finding a counter example. <laughs> I am not saying that n is not enough, but I am not ready to confirm it either. I do not know. So I am scanning from left to right. At this point, I cannot say that n is enough. Let us see. So this is the art gallery theorem. Let us let us not keep you for and suspense for a long time it says that n by 3 guards for any polygon n by 3 guards are always sufficient and sometimes necessary. Necessary example is easy that for this example for this polygon I can extend it as long as possible I need floor of n by 3 guards. This is a general example. You can extend this structure as long as you can, but still we need floor of n by 3 guards. But how to prove that n by 3 is always enough? You give me a polygon with n vertices, I will produce a guards of size n by 3. Let us see. So we need to prove that we need some tools. The first tool is a diagonal. What is a diagonal? <coughs> diagonal is a line segment joining two non-adjacent vertices of the polygon so that the entire line segment is inside the polygon. For example, this is a diagonal, but say this is not a diagonal. Because the, if I join this two vertices, the, the line segment is not entirely inside. Clear? Again, you have to believe me one thing that it is always possible to triangulate a simple polygon using diagonals. It seems obvious, but there is a proof for this. And I can show that number of triangles in this triangulation will always be n minus 2. Any polygon, any polygon can be divided into triangles which we call triangulation. It can be partitioned into triangles. How many triangles? n minus 2 triangles only using diagonals. Only using diagonals other than po polygon edges. Any questions? <coughs> Please let me know if you have any questions. Hmm. Everything, the diagonals are the red lines and 
these are the triangles. This is one triangle, this is another triangle, this is another triangle. I am partitioning the whole polygon into triangles. Yes. So, this is everything. Internal means? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is also counted. Everything is counted. There will be always n by n minus 2 triangles and I will only use diagonals, no other lines. Right? Is the definition of a triangulation is clear? Okay. And, okay, why to, like, let us have this as homework as well. I will check this during the tutorial session. But can you prove this? It will be very similar to what we are, we were going to do next. That we have to prove that any polygon can be triangulated using diagonals. The number of triangles will be n minus 2. Okay. Again, we have next what we should do, try to analyze the properties of the whole thing. The first property is that, again we are trying to look from a different angle. We have a triangulation, we have a polygon, but together they are forming a graph. What is that graph? What are the vertices of the, what is the graph? Graph is a structure defined by vertices and edges. What is the vertices of this graph that I am talking about? Is the triangle, uh, the polygon vertices. What are the edges of this graph? The edges of the polygon and the triangulation diagonals. Diagonals used for the triangulation. So, this is the graph. I can consider this as a graph. Is it clear? Question. What are the properties of this graph? The first property that comes to our mind is the graph is planar. The way we have constructed the graph or the way we have defined the diagonals, this graph is a planar graph. If the graph is a planar graph, what property that comes to mind first? That this is four colorable. That is settled. I ask you a different question that, okay, this is a planar graph, but it is very special kind of a planar graph. This is a very special kind of a planar graph. Can we say that this graph is three colorable? Can we say that? I do not know that yet, that whether the graph can be three colored or not. Hmm? Do not jump to the conclusion that easily. Let us see, we will see that whether the graph is three colorable or not. But suppose the graph, this graph is three colorable, then what? With this property, what I will do? Suppose the graph is three colorable, then what? Can we say something? Suppose uh, for the time being, you just believe me that the graph is three colorable. Then what? Can we see, can you see n by 3 guards? How many guards required to guard a triangle? So, if I choose one vertex from each triangle, are we good? Suppose I choose a set of vertices so that every triangle has at least one vertex in it. Then I am seeing the whole polygon because every point is a part of a triangle. Take any point in the polygon because it is a partition of the polygon. Any point is a part of a triangle and if 
from each triangle I have one representative guard, then it has to be a guard set for the whole polygon. Right? The possible. Then I will say that, for example, this guard can say this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle. Right? It is possible, but in a way we are trying to choose one vertex from each triangle. Question, can you see the n by 3 bound? What is the coloring? Coloring is, I have three boxes. One is red, one is green, one is blue. And each of the vertices belongs to one of these three boxes. This vertex has color green, I take this, put it in the green box. This vertex is blue, I put it in the blue box. If I have distributed n balls into three boxes, I know that one box contains at most n by 3 many vertices. What I have done? I have distributed n balls into three boxes. Any way I distribute, there has to be a box containing at most n by 3 balls or n by 3 vertices. Pigeon hole principle. Right? Choose that color. What is the color here? It is a blue. What I will do? How many blue color vertices are there? n by 3 at most. I will place guards at each blue vertex. What I will do? I will place guard at each blue vertex. Can we claim that we have a guard set for the whole polygon? Yes? Because each vertex, each, why each triangle should have a blue vertex? Because it is proper coloring. I have taken it for granted. Everyone knows the definition of a proper coloring? Please raise your hand if you do not know what is a proper coloring is for a graph. You do not know what is a proper coloring is? Okay. So, if you have a graph, a proper coloring is a way to assign colors to the vertices so that no two adjacent vertex gets the same color. So, if you have a triangle and you have a proper coloring, what do you know? So, this is your graph. They form a triangle. If there is a proper coloring, this, this and this has to get three different colors. Right? So, the same goes for this problem as well. Here this graph, I have, I have done a proper coloring. That means each triangle gets three different colors. So, each triangle has a representative from blue whose size is at most n by 3. Till now are you with me? All good? That but, but still the question remains, does this graph is 3 colorable or not? If it is 3 colorable, we are done. Because it is, you see that this is very tricky situation. Each triangle needs 3 colors. And it is like it is full of triangles. It is not very sparse graph. It is kind of a in dense in some sense. Triangle can be colored with 3 colors. So, for each triangle you need 3 colors. I am talking about the whole graph. And the graph is full of triangles. How can we prove that this graph will be 3 colorable? Think. So, if I give you the proof, it will not going to help you. You will learn another proof. But the objective is to ready, make you ready so that one day you can produce a proof like this. Let us think. Why this is 3 colorable? So, to prove that, I will introduce another concept of a dual graph. What is a dual graph? 
where every triangle becomes a vertex and there is edge between two triangles. Every region or every triangle becomes a vertex and there is edge between two triangles if they share a common chord or a common diagonal. So, this is called a dual graph. So, this po polygon this is a dual graph. Now, what is the property of this dual graph? Again property is everything. Small properties are trivial properties leads to very good algorithms or very good results. What is the property? What is the degree of each vertex? No. What is the vertex? Vertex represent a triangle. How many neighbors a triangle can have? At most? Three. One, two or three? So, it forms a tree. Very good. Why? If you claim something, it is your responsibility to prove. Because it looks like a tree for this example. Exactly. Little bit more formally. What is the edge represent? In this graph, in this dual graph, what is the edge represents? A diagonal. A diagonal. What is this edge represents? This represents this diagonal in some sense. What happens if I cut the polygon from the diagonal? I take a scissor and cut the polygon along the diagonal. I will get two polygons, right? That means if I remove any edge from this dual graph, I will get two separate graph. What graph has that property? A tree. The basic first theorem in graph theory or in tree that if you have a connected graph and if you remove any edge it becomes disconnected then it is a tree. There is a sequence of this if you go by Harare's book there is a sequence of 3, 4 things which implies one another. So, the dual graph is a tree. So, what? So, if you have a tree, what we will have always? A leaf node. Every tree has a leaf node. Right? Okay. Okay. So, every tree has a leaf node. So, we have a leaf node in the dual graph for this tree as well. Now, let us go back to the do our proof that this triangulation along with the polygon edges, the graph induced by this actually is three colorable. And how will prove that? I will prove that by induction. What is the induction hypothesis? That any polygon with n vertices for any polygon for any polygon with n vertices one equal p g p comma t can be colored with three colors. What is the induction step? True for n less than k. We will prove for n equals to k. Right? Suppose you have a polygon with k vertices, we prove that this is three colorable. How will prove that? We will see the dual graph, we know the leaf node. I will find out one such leaf node, I will delete that corresponding triangle. Delete means I will keep that edge, keep this edge 
but I will remove this edge and this edge. By induction hypothesis, what do I know? This is a polygon with k minus 1 vertices after deleting the edges, which is 3 colorable. What I will do now? I will glue back the one triangle and I have, known, I have known that I have used two colors, but still I have one left. I will use that for the last vertex. So, that is it. And we have the final theorem that n by 3 guards sometimes necessary and always sufficient. So, I will stop my lecture here today and before stopping I have this following two books which you may consult for the further results or reading purpose. Thank you.